نحمده ونسلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد The question is why there is difference of opinion with regards to the prayers Prayers being the most essential part of our deen but one of the pillars of Islam and we see that people do come up with different styles from the time of early Muslims, Imams so how is it how can we understand why there has been so much of differences in the prayers? So first of all, understand that there are certain core actions or steps to be followed in prayer, which are called faraib, integral part, or the pillars of prayer. And for that, there is no difference of opinion among the fuqaha, among the scholars because these are maintained by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam categorically through his sayings and also they are found in Quran and explained by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his saying as I mentioned and also through his action so Ummah is unanimous on the fact that these are the essential parts for example to have the intention to stand up qiyam for those who are able and to perform ruku' which is bowing down and also the sajda the prostration for this much there is no difference of opinion the scholars work together they all agree because these are mentioned in quran they are also mentioned in hadith and together they make the core of the prayer with regards to other actions which are mustahabbat or sunan, emphasized, non emphasized, but these are generally differed upon. And why is that? The reason is very simple. The Rasulullah himself prayed these extra actions in different ways over the period of his Madani period, the time he spent in Medina. He had variation in his action. And why is that then? The wisdom behind this is that this is the new nature of human being, that they like tanabbu'. Tanabbu' means variation, differences. If there was monotony in action, people would have found it very difficult to practice. Because by the very nature of human being, they cannot do the things which are monotonous which are uniform and Islam doesn't expect people to be uniform it is a flowing it is a moving religion it is the religion which continues to grow and expand and get more people incorporated because this is the final word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it has to be fluid enough to incorporate as many as possible and the leeway that makes things easy even if it's wrong, because it's the attitude which counts, is the intention which counts, as opposed to the action per se. So, for example, if it was all mandatory, everything was essential, everything was done in just one way, there would have been many people who would fall short. Now you see, some people perform in one way, some in a different way, and that keeps the harmony among the ummah many people claim that there have been issues over the differences of opinion but you would not find people fighting over these matters in masajid except for some ignorance when a group makes it must as opposed to a recommendation and this has been a literal understanding and reading of deen over the last 150 years prior to that people would not fight over these matters now people would say oh but we know there were four musallas there were four places four corners for leading the prayer in haram at one time so again that was not to fight over that was to be inclusive of everything unfortunately people give it completely wrong twist you would not give one example, you would not find one scenario where Hanafis and Shafi'in and Malikin and Hanbalis fought each other. They took 
swords against each other. Never ever. It has never been the case. There they argued with decorum, with respect, the ulama, they were right against the opponent's views, proving that that was wrong, with the possibility that they may be wrong as well. This is why in the legitimate difference of opinion there has been no censuring. People say, oh, your view is wrong. But no one considered other imams' view to be wrong for them. They say it's legitimate. They have got the view. They have got the basis for it. We do not accept that base, but they are qualified and they have to have it. That is why when Imam Malik was asked by Harun al-Rashid, who was the Khalif of the time, he said, oh Imam, why don't you just compile a book which has all the opinions, like you know, all, all the correct ways, most authentic according to you, and I would you know, distribute it among the Ummah and I would make it a must for people to follow and we would not have any other opinions floating around. Imam Malik said, not at all, not at all. He wouldn't do it. He said, no, it's not permissible. I can't do it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this religion to be much more open and inclusive. And we know of various narrations. There are Sahaba in Medina after Rasulullah passed away who would never do roughly again, raising hands while going into Ruku, while going into Sajda. And at the same time, the Sahaba in Makkah, they would do it. And they're both considered to be valid opinions. Now, which is preferred over the other, that is the discussion. As opposed to something being fard or wajib or must or not to carry out a haram or what. No, it has never been the discussion among Aymar. That is why no one censured others. Likewise, for example, Fatih, the biggest discussion is about, which is the biggest difference as well, is on Fatiha Khalf al-Imam, reciting Surah Fatiha behind the Imam. And even in that, Imam al-Shafi said you have to do it. And Imam Abu Hanifa said that you shouldn't do it. And yet, if someone has done it, Imam Hanifa said your prayer is still valid. No one asks you to repeat the prayer. Imam Shafi doesn't, doesn't say that anyone who follows Hanafi Fiqh and they perform their prayer, their prayer is invalid. They say, according to them, it's fine. But they shouldn't be doing it because according to us, we follow this particular opinion. So they had legitimate differences of opinion based on various narration on the matter. Because it is agreed upon by the consensus of Ummah that Rasulullah used to have raising the hand even between two sajda, even before salam. And then subsequently he abrogated it. He said it, no, leave it, don't do it. So he is the one who initially did it and then changed it. And there has been similar issues. So you would find apparently contradictory narrations on the same matter. But that is the very nature of the fluid religion, where you keep the certain boundaries a little bit looser, so that you can incorporate as many as possible. Otherwise, if you keep it very hard and fast, people would run away. Likewise, you would not see ulama fighting over these matters. Now, Imam al-Shafi, he came to visit the ulama and the people of Kufa. And then he came to the place called Aadhamiya, which is where Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah is buried. That was his place, his maqam. And there was a masjid there. So it was announced that he would lead Fajr prayer there. So the Hanafi ulama who used to live in and around Kufa, they all traveled to come and pray behind Imam al-Shafi Rahmatullah. When Imam led the prayer, According to him, it is Sunnah Mu'akkada to recite Qulut in the second rakat of Fajr prayer throughout the year. So he led the prayer, Fajr prayer, and he did not do that Raful Yadayn, and he didn't do that Qulut in Fajr prayer. When the prayer finished, the local and the people who came from around Kufa to the masjid for Fajr prayer only to pray behind Imam al-Shafi have the privilege and honor of that. They said, 
Yeah, Imam Abdul didn't do the Fulia Day, which you say that we should do. You emphasize on that. Imam Shafi Rahmatullah responded saying, I didn't do it in honor of this Sahib al Qabr. You know, he pointed to the you know graveyard where Sayyidina Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah is buried. He's saying that this Sahib al Qabr, me, the Imam, is in that grave and I'm in his area. So I would rather follow his view and I didn't do it to honor him, to respect him. And the scholars who were there, they said, Wallahi, we came here to pray behind you so that we could follow your opinion on this one occasion. And that was the openness among the Aymah. You would not find people, you know, threatening each other, censuring each other, calling names, calling each other disbeliever or muqtadi or kafir or no. They were so open, even now. I have not found ulama fighting over that in my 30 years of studying with ulama. We debate, we discuss, we do whatever, but we wouldn't fight. And you could see this practically happening in and around the world. If you find scholars from different ulama, as long as they are ulama, they respect each other. It's a common man for the ignorance, the ignoramuses, the laity. They would take one view, one view, and then make it a part as though there's no other view. For them, I mean, it is lack of education, unfortunately, and they shouldn't be making those decisions and judgments. Anyway, so Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam had various opinions. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam led Sahaba, 124,000 of them, and they spread. Some saw Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam doing one particular action, and they just carried on with that because they had not known anything different. But those Sahaba who remain in Medina, that is why Imam Malik rahmatullah alayhi, he is the one who narrates the hadith of Raf'ul Yadayn from the golden chain, golden chain, his Silsilat al Zahab, which is Imam Bukhari's Silsilat al Zahab as well, where Imam Malik narrating from Nafi' and he is narrating from Abdullah ibn Umar, and who is narrating from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Quite strong chain, and yet. Imam Malik, after quoting this hadith, he said that I do not act, we do not act on this. And the, the reason he says is because we have not found anyone in Medina doing the Fulia Dain. We accept the hadith of Sahih, we accept this is one of the best narrations on this topic. But there is the action, Amalu Ahlil Medina, they do not do it. So we consider that to be abrogated by the Amal of Sahaba and their students Tabi'in and their students Abba Tabi'in. Otherwise, as a whole Ummah cannot leave it behind. Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatullah said, so we know of 500 Sahaba in and around Iraq. They wouldn't do Rafu Jadayn. Based on that, we do not do it. We know the Hadith is Sahih. We know there is a Hadith. We know Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it. Now, what was the last action that's to be discussed. That's not clear. That's deferred upon. So the dif uh, dispute is on which is the preferred, which is the best way. Had it been a must action of the prayer, some of the Imams would have taken it. None of the Imams has, has ever taken the Raf'ul Yadayn to be part of the prayer, integral part of the prayer, which makes your prayer invalid if you leave it. None of the Imams took that uh, position. But the four Imams, you know, Definitely. And there may be rarity here and there, but I didn't preserve those opinions. Those opinions are gone. So that is very clear to us. It is not about the uniformity. It is about unity that Islam is interested in. So you would find, in, and this is not just prayer, every matter, you'd be hard pushed to find something where there's no difference of opinion. And that's in human nature. It would always have variation. That is why Islam survived that long and it will continue to until the end of time, inshallah ta'ala. If you make it so strict and rigid, people cannot perform that. People are not used to it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved Rasulullah to the level that he would 
deserve and make it so much of a beauty to have everything alhamdulillah practiced from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So a group of Sahaba, a group of Tabi'in, a group of Muslims would take Raful Yadayn. A group of people would take without Raful Yadayn. Some would say this, some would say I mean loud, some would, some would sit like this, some would sit like this because this is how they would see. One statement of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam could be interpreted in more than one way depending on how you look at that. So when Sahaba had this, they never censured either each other, Ummah never censured each other. This is a modern phenomenon where people have a literalist or only one specific lens that they had so they would expect everyone to see through that same thing which is never going to be a sensible thing because it would cause trouble. Yeah, there are certain essentials and integrals of being which everyone would agree on. That is why you would not find imams or ulama, scholars ever fighting that Tayyam is part of prayer, Ruku and Sujood are part of prayer. You can just do it, that's done. That's done. All the rest, they are embellishment. These are beautification of the prayer. Prayer constitutes with those essentials. Rest is additional. So what? who counts what? Alhamdulillah. Go ahead with that. That's why we suggest people to stick to one school and then you'll be fine. I hope it clarifies. So yeah, there are many narrations will differ apparently. Now some scholars would say, we take this opinion because this is the strongest of the two. The strongest based on what? The standard, what standard? Made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Told us by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa No, man-made. So again, even to come up with that standard, it is done by the fuqaha ulama. It can't be divinely inspired. It can't be divinely inspired. It has to be judged using the intellectual ability. And this is how, this is the beauty of deen. This is the beauty of human nature. They evolve. They work positively. And things get sorted out properly. May Allah give us tawfiq to understand. There's no, no dichotomy, no problem at all with that. You just stick to your school and you'll be fine. The problem is when people all want everything to be put together in the best way so that Everyone does exactly the same. We are not armies. We are not. We are worshiping Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We are remembering Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala with utmost humility. Some people find it easy to stand in one way. Others can't do it. They find that they would want to be standing in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala in a most humble, most like in a broken way. Some find it to stand like a army person. So fine. That's that's the you know the style that people can adopt. It's fine, as long as there's no arrogance in it, which Alhamdulillah is not the case with Muslim Alhamdulillah when they stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the problem is when people make it must, you have to do it this way, otherwise you're wrong. Then that's a problem. And that has never been the case with four schools, Alhamdulillah. May Allah give us the people understand.